congratulations to all of the admitted students joining us today and any family members. Um, we're excited to welcome you to today's uh, virtual admitted student event, focusing on giving everybody the opportunity to learn a little bit more about some key offices and programs um, that support our students, uh, both their physical and emotional well-being here at the university. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Neill, Senior Associate Director of Admissions here at the university. Um, I'm largely here just to kick off today's event. Uh, I will be in the background with my colleague, Kathleen Papala, if there are any questions that we can help with during this session. Um, one or two housekeeping items before I turn it over to the first of our presenters. Uh, we are in a Zoom webinar setting today. We've enabled live transcription for anybody who would benefit from using that. Uh, throughout the session, you are encouraged at any point. You don't need to wait till the end. If you have questions for any of our panelists or just things that um, we can be helpful with, to please use the Q&A box to send those questions into us at, at any point during the session. Um, the chat will not be something you can use to send in questions, so you'll want to use that Q&A box. Um, each presenter is going to present for, you know, somewhere in the realm of, of five to seven or so minutes, um, and then at the end of our session, we'll use whatever remaining time we have um, for some additional Q&A. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin, from the CARE Network. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, hi, everyone. We are so excited that you're um, connecting with U of R, and we're hoping to see you this fall. I am Caitlin Legg, the Associate Director for the CARE Network here at the University of Rochester. Um, we are an office and a program located in the Dean of Students office, and our role is to make sure that as a student and as families, you are connected to all the various resources and support that's available at the university. And so the way it works is we actually have an online referral system that um, a student or a community member, or any parent, faculty or staff can use to share that a student may be going through a tough time and could benefit from additional support. We meet with students in a private setting to learn about what's going on for them and help them connect to resources, making it as simple and easy as possible to solve any problems that might be going on for them. Um, and we like to think of ourselves as a proactive support. So um, our hope is always to connect with students before something becomes a crisis. Um, so nothing is too big or small for our area. Um, we are not therapy, so our friends at UCC will be talking a little bit about that later on in this presentation, but we do have a keen awareness of the mental health challenges that some students might face. This is a huge transition starting college, and so you can rest assured that you have a team of people that want to help. Um, in addition to the staff members in the care office, we actually have liaisons in most of the departments on campus that work with students, including public safety, financial aid, the counseling center, and many other departments to help streamline that support and keep really open lines of communication with the various resources on campus. So if you ever have concerns, whether that's mental health, academics, financial changes, or even just trouble adjusting to campus and homesickness, please reach out to us. Our website is rochester.edu slash care, and I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, that's where you can learn information as well as submit a referral. Um, I think with that, I will pass it over to my other colleagues who are presenting, um, and I look forward to meeting you all this fall. Hello, my name is Erin Ignello. I'm a peace officer with the University of Rochester Department of Public Safety. Um, I'm also the community resource officer. Um, so just a little bit of information about our department. We're 24 seven. Um, we work over at River Campus, over at the hospital and med center. Um, we have about 160 employees, 120 of those are officers. Uh, we are the third largest law enforcement agency of Monroe County. Um, so because we work 24 seven, we're able to, um, we average about 300,000 calls a year. Uh, our dispatch office monitors 800 cameras. We monitor the uh, blue phones all on campus. There's about 250 blue phones. There's 500 interior and exterior phones like the uh, phones in elevators and in stairwells. Um, we, we enforce New York state laws 
We also uh, have the ability to do a police crime report. We could do motor vehicle accidents. We could do larceny reports. Um, we could help students obtain order of protection if they need against uh, significant others. Um, so that's the law enforcement side. On the university side, we enforce university regulations. We document internal reports. We'll do like lost missing reports. Um, and we could help obtain active avoidance orders um, on, the, on the U of R side. Um, some non-emergency services we also provide are door openings, motorist assist. So unfortunately it gets kind of cold during the winter. So sometimes the cars don't start. So we're able to do like jump starts for cars um, and safety escorts on campus. Um, quickly, like I said, we're 24 operation. Um, but we do need students' help as well. So our phone number is 585-275-3333. You could also uh, utilize text messaging for that phone number as well. Um, so if students see something um, that they don't think is safe, they can contact us at any time. If they see, you know, for example, a light out over an entrance to a building, call us, notify us, and we'll make a proper notification to facility just to make sure that um, that's taken care of. Um, and it's, and safety is a shared responsibility. So it's everybody's uh, responsibility to make sure that campus is safe. And with that, I believe I'm kicking over to Tiffany Street from Title IX. Thanks, Aaron. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tiffany Street. My pronouns are she or they, and I am the Associate Director for Sexual Misconduct Prevention Education and Response in the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Um, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, there's a compliance component to our office, and so a lot of folks will hear Title IX or the Title IX office kind of refer to that. We are within the Office of Equity and Inclusion, and my responsibility as the Associate Director is to do some of the fun stuff where I actually will get to talk with your incoming students about things like creating consent culture, talking about what our policies are talking about that are prohibited behavior um, when a student is coming into the university. A lot of the times folks think Title IX is synonymous with sexual misconduct, and although it is, it is a federal law that requires um, equal access to opportunities on the basis of sex, gender identity, gender expression, um, or sexual orientation. So Although that is one of the many policies that kind of govern our work, a lot of the times folks think sexual misconduct. And I know that can be kind of a scary word for potentially prospective students or definitely parents to hear in this room. Um, and I want to kind of give you all the rest assured that the other piece of this is that we are here to make sure that if something was to happen to a student, um, we have processes and policies along with reporting options to help students get connected to if you, they want to go through our process and hold somebody accountable for behavior that they may have engaged in as well as our office provides supportive measures, um, which are pursuant to a couple of the laws that kind of govern the work of our office. Um, but there's a special ability that we have within the world of Title IX where we can provide supportive measures that some of the other offices in this area uh, frequently help and assist us with. So we might do direct connection to counseling. Um, so we might you know, be able to connect the student directly to UCC. Um, and sometimes a little bit of a wait time, if it's a high priority incident within the world of sexual misconduct, we might be able to get students a same day or same week appointment. Um, the other big piece is that we don't want students to have any detrimental outcome to their academics or their academic success here. That's pretty much the reason why Title IX exists. So we have the opportunity to work with faculty or instructors to ensure that there are academic accommodations that we can set up for um, a student with their faculty or their instructor. And again, this is an area that differs from what disability resources could do. You know, we don't require any paperwork. We don't require any tests. We aren't mandated by any of that um, in terms of the laws that we are required for ensuring compliance. Um, the other big piece, we also will work sometimes with public safety to, you know, if there needs to be safety escorts or um, kind of robust areas that we would like extra patrolling done in. Those are things that we can request as well as put in active avoidance orders as Aaron had mentioned come from three offices on campus it could be the title IX area the office of equity inclusion the department of public safety or the um, center for student conflict management and all of those uh, you know things are to be put in place to keep students safe essentially they're mutual you know no contact order or stay away order um, and those are you know based on a basis of a level of safety or safety concern for those students um, or the institution has decided that this could you know prevent other issues from happening or occurring. The other work that I get to do within my office is education. So a lot of times um, your student 
really likely the most uh, interaction they might have with Title IX is all of the training that they're going to have to take when they get here. Um, and there is a lot because, again, the laws really like to make sure that we have all this information that we can get out to um, the students that are coming in. So likely your student or for the students here, um, you'll receive some training throughout orientation. So if you're coming in, uh, for the most part, art, science and engineering, there will be a video that you're required to watch along with a quiz on Blackboard. You'll get to hear my voice rambling about things that I'm passionate about. Again, uh, creating consent culture and talking about all the policy definitions that are really important for you all to know about in terms of those um, broad terms of sexual misconduct and what fall underneath them as prohibited behavior. And then there will also be uh, online training that comes from one of our partner platforms that goes out a little bit later into the fall semester, typically September, that you get to take at your own pace. It's usually out for over a month. Um, and you know you can go on there and typically 45 minutes to an hour, you can save and come back to it. Um, and that'll help ensure that all of our students are getting an additional level of training and learning. That training is interactive uh, through that platform, which tends to be really great, it helps folks choose you know, what scenario would be best? How could they intervene in a situation if they're hearing um, behavior that might be concerning? That's a really big piece of the work that we do in our office is to encourage folks to intervene if they hear or see um, something happening that might be negative or goes against, you know, our Meliora values. And y'all will hear Meliora nonstop once you get here, or if you haven't heard it already, I'm sure you will. It means ever better. And we have a value system that goes along with Meliora as well. We really rely on that heavily in our office. Um, and each of the letter has um, its own term. So that'll be also another thing that you might hear throughout those trainings. Again, we are available, um, not 24 seven, but we understand things that might be happening late in the evenings or on the weekends. And there are also a lot of staff members that help us um, get information to our office so that we can connect directly to a student, and provide them with all those options that I've spoken about. I'm also gonna copy Caitlin and drop all of my information as well into the chat. Um, and folks can feel free to check out our website. That's where, again, a lot of this information lives. It's rochester.edu slash sexual misconduct. There's also a way for anybody to report a community member, a person at this institution as well um, through an online reporting form. And that online reporting form can be filled out anonymously. We've had folks from all over the United States, other countries utilize it. So um, again, it, it really helps get the information to the university so that the university and the staff and Office of Equity Inclusion can take the steps to help keep folks safe here at the institution. And with that, I am out of my time, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to UHS. Thanks, Tiff. Um, good afternoon. My name is Christy Brock, and I'm the Business Operations Manager for University Health Service. Um, we're commonly referred to as UHS, so you will get used to hearing us refer to that as UHS quite a bit. Um, our mission is to improve the health and well being of University um, of Rochester students and staff, and we have a very diverse and caring group of staff who take that mission very seriously. Um, please think of UHS as your first point of contact for any healthcare related matter um, from university requirements, such as insurance and health history forms and immunization compliance to primary care and then optional services such as behavioral health, physical therapy, nutritional therapy, etc. UHS has three office locations and evening and weekend hours available to provide quick and convenient scheduling options for our students. We have our River Campus office, and that's located on the UHS building on the first floor. We have our Eastman office, which is located on the Eastman School of Music campus in the Student Living Center. And then we have our Medical Center office located right over in the hospital on 601 Elmwood Avenue. The first thing I want to discuss is requirements. All full-time students, incoming full-time students, have two main health requirements that they need to complete prior to the start of classes. The first one being insurance. Students are required to have health insurance, and that health insurance must meet our criteria. So students with their own health insurance can waive if their private health insurance meets those waiver criteria of the university. Um, if they don't waive, they will be enrolled in the school's health insurance. It is a hard waiver process, which means you are required to either waive or enroll. Any students who fail to take action will be enrolled in the school's health insurance plan. That process is completed during the open enrollment period, which is June 7th to September 15th each year. So if your student is here for four years, they would be completing the process once a year, every year for those four years. 
students who successfully waive um, will be still charged the mandatory health fee. Mandatory health fee is um, separate from insurance. There's two different pieces. Every single full-time student is charged the mandatory health fee, and then students can either waive or enroll in the school's health insurance. The school's health insurance plan is administrated through Aetna, and it's a platinum level insurance plan designed to work in tandem with the mandatory health fee and cover services that the mandatory health fee does not, such as laboratory testing, x-rays, surgeries, specialist office visits, hospitalizations, and prescription medications, um, as well as others. Those are just some of the common ones that we usually list off. Um, and we have insurance adv advisors available five days a week all throughout the year. So even on school breaks or summer vacations, our staff are still here um, and still available to help students all year long. We encourage students to reach out to their insurance advisors um, with any questions, whether it's silly or small um, or something more significant. Um, they can help make recommendations before the services happen as far as coverage or referral requirements that might need to happen. So it's always good to reach out ahead of time. Another requirement is the health history form and immunization requirements. All full-time students are required to submit their health history and immunization forms through UHS Connect. UHS Connect is a secure provider portal that allows students to communicate with their providers and administrative staff. Um, and that's how we submit our forms. All the immunization requirements can be found on their website under the health requirements for entering students tab. And then any questions regarding those health history forms or immunization compliance can be directed to um, their health history form advisor. Um, let's see. As far as services offered by the University Health Service, um, we start out by assigning every single full-time student a primary health care provider. This is automatic. Um, even without your student taking any action, they're automatically going to be assigned to one of our primary care physicians. And all office visits to those primary care physicians are going to be unlimited and covered under the mandatory health fee. Um, each student pays the mandatory health fee, as I mentioned previously. And this fee covers unlimited office visits to primary care providers for evaluation and management of acute injury and illness, ongoing medical conditions, women's health care, allergy injections, immunization administration, and the care and advice for any health concerns. It also covers UHS psychiatric assessment and medication management with a referral from your primary care physician or a UCC therapist. Mandatory health fee also covers services offered by our health promotion department, which my colleagues um, Zoe and Rebecca will outline in further detail during the HPO portion of this presentation. It also covers a comprehensive initial assessment and individual treatment plan provided by the University Counseling Center. UCC also offers additional services such as couples and group therapy, which my colleague Michael will outline during the UCC portion of this presentation. Additional services offered at UHS, UHS um, include but are not limited to nutritional therapy, physical therapy, psychiatric care, lab testing, allergy injections, sexual health, inclusive health care, gender affirming care, medications, travel care, and immunizations. That's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to our HPO team. Hi, my name is Rebecca Block, and I'm the health educator at the UHS Health Promotion Office. And so the Health Promotion Office's mission is to inspire University of Rochester students to live, grow, and thrive on campus. Our team provides a variety of health education and wellness programs. And so we focus on a variety of different topics that are most meaningful to our student body, including inclusive health, mental well-being, mindfulness, nourishment and body image, sexual health, and sleep. And so beginning with our mental health focus, we have several different events that go on throughout the semester. So every month we have our pause for stress relief event. That is where we bring in therapy dogs um, to our Gherkin Athletic Center, as well as the Eastman School um, Student Living Center. And this has been a really great and um, well-attended program. It allows students to decrease their own stress and improve their mood, specifically if they need a break and need to relax in between their studies. Every month we also hold de-stress fests, and these take place in the Wells Brown Oasis. So this is a place in the library that we've collaborated with the library to make this a wellness space for individuals. And so during our de-stress fest, individuals can engage in a variety of fun, stress-relieving activities during finals or midterms. 
And in this room, there not only is yoga mats, meditation cushions, a labyrinth, plants, coloring games, and more for students any time of the day. But specifically during our de-stress events, we have activities such as board games, chair massages, puzzles, therapy dogs, meditations, crafts, and even stress balls. And we also have the mental health fair. So every spring we have a mental health fair that's led by us. And we bring together not only campus partners, but also community health resources all in one place. And at this event, participants are able to engage in fun, engaging activities to learn about mental health, learn a variety of self-care practices, and also meet registered community groups and organizations and even therapy dogs. So as you can tell, we love therapy dogs and students also love them as well. So there's many different circumstances you can meet them. And so focusing on mindfulness, we have a huge collaboration um, called the Mindful University Project. So this initiative's mission is to empower our campus community to build a culture of mindful presence and compassion. And so our work really focuses on allowing our students to improve their mental well-being, boost academic flourishing, increase resiliency to stress, and reduce levels of anxiety and depression in higher education. And so our goal is to create a safe and inclusive space for all students, even staff and faculty, to learn and engage in mindfulness through many different programs. We have candlelight yoga. We have silent meditation retreats that are four hours long. We have Koro meditation classes, which are four-week learn to meditate classes that are evidence-based. Um, and so we have nine teachers who teach them throughout the academic semester. And for our first years, we actually are going to be offering at least 10 different offerings for individuals as well as tailored groups. Um, so look out for those when you come onto campus. We also are interested in equipping individuals with learning how to facilitate mindfulness sessions to their peers. And so this past year, we did create a Mindful University Student Mindfulness Facilitation Program, which is now also part of the Medallion Program at the university. And the Medallion Program, you may learn about in a different way um, as you enter onto campus, but it's a great way to be equipped with leadership skills and you can get credit for that. We also have upcoming events such as Mindful Triathlon that we've been wanting to plan, but since COVID happened, we haven't actually enacted in that. So we're hoping to bring that um, in the next two years. And we also have days of mindfulness. So we had one over Instagram um, last spring, and now we're having one in person where you can just engage in tons of different mindfulness activities all in one day. And then before I hand the torch over to Zoe to talk about sexual health, nourishment and body image is also really important to us. And so we acknowledge that while nourishing local food choices are readily available across campus, we realize that being a college student is quite demanding and it can be difficult to navigate all these different options and find time to eat. And so we have a lot of different programs that help you to learn different practical tips and real life strategies to help you fuel your mind and body, which are essential to learning. So we have an event called Nourish to Flourish that is focused on mindful eating. And we also talk about diet culture and individuals can have some snacks during this time. We also have an event called Quick and Tasty Meal Prep. And so this is an hour long demonstration that educates students about how you can make not only nourishing meals in your dorm, but also fast and at an affordable price. And we also have an online um, challenge called Eat My Fleet. And this is a 21 day online email challenge that provides students with practical tips and strategies to cultivate a healthier relationship with food. So now I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Zoe. Hello, my name is Zoe Black. I am the program coordinator in the health promotion office. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, another area that we focus on is sexual health. Um, so one thing we do offer are safer sex supplies, such as condoms and dental dams. Um, they're available all across campus, specifically in the UHS building, in residence halls, um, in the student common area, and then as well as um, they are able to be delivered to students' mailboxes for free and anonymously. 
um, just with an easy online request form. We also offer STI testing. This is available by appointment at UHS, but aside from that, we offer STI testing clinics in partnership with local organizations such as the Department of Health and a local LGBTQ plus health organization. And we also have a few large sexual health events throughout the year. So one of those is our Sex and Chocolate Carnival. So this is around Halloween each year, and we have lots of different organizations from on campus and off campus that come to educate our students, provide lots of fun games and giveaways, um, and lots of chocolate. And then we also have our Sex in the Dark event every spring. And this consists of a panel of sexual health and relationship experts from the community, both on and off campus. And they are there to answer questions that students have and can submit ahead of time um, for this panel. And our last area of focus is inclusive health. Um, so this year we had our first annual LGBTQ plus resource fair. Um, so this consisted of um, on and off campus resources for our LGBTQ students. And this, we had lots of giveaways, resources, um, therapy dogs, like Rebecca said, we do love those. Um, and we also have our queer health resource guide that is available online or printed in our office that includes lots of information on various topics such as physical and mental health care, coming out where all of the all gender restrooms on campus are and more information in there as well. And then lastly, we work with um, all of our UHS and UCC staff to provide them ongoing trainings on important issues to the LGBTQ community, to different communities such as people of color um, and other groups that may face unique health challenges. So now I will pass it over to Mike from UCC. Thanks Zoe. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Mike Sember and I'm a staff psychologist, uh, also the outreach coordinator here at the University Counseling Center or, or UCC for short. Here at the UCC, we're staffed by a multidisciplinary team of psychologists, social workers, psychiatric providers, and psychology and social work interns. Our mission is to help you with your emotional health uh, and development while you're here at the U of R. We see about 1,500 students among graduates and undergraduates uh, every year for a range of mental health issues, from stress to depression to relationship issues, you name it, uh, we see it for students. You might consider connecting with us if you're experiencing any of those or really for any reason why something isn't going particularly well for you uh, at that moment. Um, at the UCC, we respect and acknowledge difference, and we're committed to diversity as a core value here. We strive to provide our services within a context that values the uniqueness of every student and remains sensitive to cultural and individual diversity in the immediate and extended community. The main location is on the River Campus, the third floor of the UHS building. We're right next to the SUB Res Hall. Right now, we're doing a lot of Zoom appointments for students, so you can connect with us anywhere on campus. We also do see students in person. Either way, if you want to connect with us, please call our main number, which I'll put in the chat, um, and you can find on our website. Mm -hmm. Confidentiality is the cornerstone of what we do here at the UCC. So if you're over 18 uh, or over, if you're over 18, 18 or over, excuse me, we can't confirm or deny uh, your engagement here with us unless you give us explicit written permission to do so or in rare situations that limit that confidentiality. You can always sign a release of information if you do want us to share information or connect with somebody about you. We do several things here at the UCC. Um, they're available to every full-time student. To connect with us, we ask you to call our office. Again, I'll send you, I'll put that number in the chat to set up an initial assessment. During that meeting, which will be a one-hour meeting between you and a counselor here, you'll share what's going on and the two of you will develop an individualized treatment plan that may include a number of possibilities, for instance, group therapy, couples therapy, short-term individual therapy with us, a platform called My Student Support, which is a 24-7 real-time phone and chat support service we offer, psychiatric consultation or long-term therapy in the community, the student health insurance plan that my colleague Christy mentioned earlier covers a good number of therapists in the community, and many of them have, have co-pays of $10 with, with no deductibles. If you can't wait for an initial assessment, we also offer same-day appointments for those situations. Again, you can just reach us through our main number. Um, I mentioned our number many times, so it's important you plug that number in your phone when you're here because um, it's really that easy connecting with us, calling that number. You can also check out information on our website, and we do post to Facebook and Instagram. We also uh, have a mental health professional on call 24-7 that you can reach through that main number again after hours for mental health emergencies. So please do call that if you're ever in a mental health emergency, either for yourself or if you're concerned for a fellow student. 
um, you'll call that number and we certainly will answer um, and want to help you with that situation. We also have a program. Um, we have several counselors in residence. These are spe um, specially trained graduate students here at U of R on campus who may respond to after hours mental health emergencies um, in various situations. So in closing, I just wanted to share that we do see an enormous number of students here at the UCC who, who may feel as though everyone else has got it together and they're the only ones struggling, um, but please know that you certainly are not the only one and you can always reach out and connect with us here at UCC. Well, thanks, uh, Mike, and thanks to all of our panelists. That was a lot of great information in a very condensed period of time. Um, I see that a couple of questions have come in, and our panelists have typed some answers into some, but there are a couple here that we're going to pivot uh, into doing live Q&A for. Um, and if you do have any additional questions at this point, or maybe anything that wasn't touched upon by some of our panelists that would be helpful, um, I encourage you to kind of throw those questions into the Q&A. Uh, but we'll start with this question about um, advice for parents who may not be able to reach their student at some point. Um, Caitlin, could I ask you to, to speak on that and then any other panelists who'd like to? Sure thing, thank you. Um, this is a great question. So um, I'm gonna put the answer in two categories. If you are a parent who can't reach your student and you have immediate concern for their safety or there is an urgent crisis and like you need to talk to them ASAP, um, you should call our Department of Public Safety. Um, Aaron, as Aaron said, their phone number is 585-275-3333. Um, and that will, they can conduct a welfare check and actually either call or locate physically your student, um, maybe in their dorm room perhaps, to make sure that they're safe and okay um, and facilitate that connection with you. If the concern isn't at a crisis level and you're just feeling like, hmm, this is weird, it's not aligning with how my um, student typically behaves, um, or maybe they miss a phone call with you, you can submit a care referral through our website, um, fill out the form through the link that I put in the chat, and um, we can call or email you to talk further about the situation, get any necessary background info, and then we would reach out and connect with your student um, and encourage them to connect with you as well as make sure that they're just so that they're okay um, and that the reason they're not connecting um, isn't related to maybe a mental health concern or something else. Um, during that time, we may also make a referral for you as the parent to Dawn Bruner, who is the director in our parent and family programs office. And she's also a fantastic resource for families who are navigating that transition to college. Um, so those are the top two things that I would recommend if you're not hearing from your student and I'll open it up if anyone else has suggestions. Yep, I'll just chime in um, with public safety. Don't hesitate <clears throat> to call. We get called quite a bit, especially in the beginning of the school year when parents are trying to reach out to their uh, the students. Um, we're also crisis intervention trained have more than half of our officers. So uh, we we do conduct a, a, a decent amount of check the welfares when students are having a difficult time. Um, and actually in recent years, I've had uh, parents come up to me during move-in weekend asking if there's a way that they can connect with public safety. Um, the student had like um, their glucose levels would able to be seen by their parents so they just want to be able to connect with us so that if they got a, an alarm at two in the morning out of state that their uh, student has lower high blood uh, glucose levels that public safety we flag in our um, in our database the student where they live so it's easier for us to find them and then uh, check to make sure that they're okay sometimes students don't wake up to the alarm or whatever but we're able to help facilitate that as well. Great. Thanks to both Caitlin and, and Aaron for your comments on that. Um, there's another question that came in um, talking about areas of the city of, of Rochester that maybe our students um, don't interact with as much. Uh, and maybe I, I'd love to, to put this question out and, and, and maybe ask Aaron first and, and anybody else who has some comments to maybe just talk a little bit more in, in response to that question and maybe also just 
um, anything about how our students interact in a safe way while also recognizing we are part uh, of a large urban community at the same time. Erin? Yes, um, so we do fall within city limits. So it's very much so, even though it's a smaller scale, but city living. So just, you know, um, being able to be, or if you're surrounding, not to be distracted. If you're walking around with your face and your phone and headphones on, um, for other than safety reasons, but if a car had to swerve out of the way of a squirrel or an animal crossing the road, sometimes students are so involved in their phones and listening to music that they wouldn't even know that a car like jumped a curb or something. Um, and obviously any college, we always kind of uh, encourage the buddy system walking around um, campus or off campus, but I was born, raised Rochester, never left. I've never been afraid to walk from point A to point B. Um, the city of Rochester itself has great uh, festivals once the weather breaks. Um, so they have like the Jazz Fest that's downtown the heart of Rochester, literally outside of Eastman School of Music. Um, so that's just, you know, fun time to have by all. Uh, and campus does offer shuttle services to and from uh, Eastman School of Music, which is located literally like on Main Street of the city of Rochester. Aaron, do you mind if I jump in from a Office of Equity and Inclusion lens as well? We communicate frequently with our community partners. A lot of our students get um, engage with our community partners as well. A lot of our students will eventually live in the city of Rochester. They may decide that um, they no longer want to live on campus. They'd like to get a house with their friends. Um, they may live in neighborhoods in the city. Um, so I don't think we like to ever say there's an area that you should avoid. Uh, as Aaron had said, it's really just using some common sense and keeping yourself safe and aware of your surroundings, which um, is likely the same where your student is currently at. So um, understanding that Rochester, the city of Rochester provides a deep, uh, rich culture, um, histories dating back to LGBTQ rights, um, human rights, um, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, cultural, diverse neighborhoods. Um, and we encourage our students to take advantage of uh, the rich history here in the city of Rochester. Um, and they will have lots of opportunities to do that. Um, potentially in Wilson Day when they get here as first year students to engage in some um, community outreach and leadership opportunities. And a lot of our offices um, do frequently work with community partners in the city of Rochester, which means our students are doing the same thing. And we might refer folks um, to the city of Rochester uh, resources that we have um, in the area. So I think too, to understand that we are very lucky to have such a rich, um, diverse area that provides such additional resources uh, to students on top of the resources that we all are here to provide um, at the university itself. Thanks to you both. I'll just briefly share personally as, as somebody who's lived in the city for, for quite a, a while himself. Um, uh, I, I, I would similarly just emphasize how how great an opportunity is and how easily accessible it is for many of our students to not only get so so involved on campus but to really easily spread out and get involved in meaningful ways whether that's through different offices and organizations on campus or just going out into the south wedge or down to park avenue for dinner or you know using kind of that second campus that you have right downtown at the eastman school as a really kind of easy focal point to start exploring um, a really walkable and, and interactive part of the city and i'll i'll certainly put in another quick plug for the shuttle system that was mentioned earlier so there are a number of shuttles that our students utilize that travel not just around in between our campuses and different residential life facilities that might be slightly off campus um, but also navigate to to different parts of the city of rochester uh, as well as taking advantage of the fact that you know uh, as aaron said we are within the city limits but just barely uh, and the suburbs and larger shopping centers, grocery stores are, are just about as far away from us as maybe getting into to downtown as well. And there's even a, there's an app now that students can download and they can watch all the shuttles going around, which means you don't have to be standing out at the, the shuttle bus stop in, in January or February, where maybe the weather here in Rochester <laughs> is less amenable uh, than it is on this beautiful day outside to be by um, the shuttle stop. Um, I see a question here about uh, do public safety officers receive EN, EMT training? Um, anything maybe, Aaron, you could say about that? We have all of our officers are um, AD, CPR, and Narcan trained. 
Um, and then there is a MERT team, medical emergency response team that um, has students, it's essentially student ran EMT service. Um, they were on a bit of a hiatus with uh, COVID, but I believe they're gonna come back in some form um, next semester. And we do have the luxury of the uh, Strong Memorial House Hospital across the street. Um, sometimes, you know, for sprained ankles or broken ankles, we have the ability to um, obviously reach out to AMR and um, they'll come assess the student as well. Are there defibrillators? Yes, we have um, defibrillators located in numerous parts um, on campus and in buildings. I know the athletic department, they have at least two in that building and some of the academic buildings. And inside of the defibrillator slash AED kits are also um, doses of Narcan and stop the bleed kits as well. Okay, I'm gonna put one more quick call out for any questions um, that you haven't had a chance to ask yet. Um, we still have about 15 minutes or so left in our webinar, um, but as with many things on Zoom, uh, we'll, we'll end a little early um, uh, unless there are more questions or um, additional things that folks are, are interested in hearing about. Patrick, I'll put in another plug just to say that I know we talked about a lot of information today, and if folks have trouble keeping track of it, perhaps this is a self-serving plug, but if you have trouble keeping track of stuff or you're not sure where to go, you can always start with a care network referral, and we can make sure you're getting to the right person who's either in this Zoom room or outside of it. I often like to describe the program as just the place to go when you don't know where to go. Um, so you can feel free to submit a referral for yourself or your student or another person through um, that website that I linked in the chat. Excellent, Caitlin, thank you so much for that. Uh, and your, your comment there just reminded me that I'll also just quickly promote another session we're having tomorrow with uh, our colleagues from the Office of Disability Resources. Um, so if folks were hoping to maybe hear a little bit uh, about the work that that office does around accommodations for our students and, and other support services, we'd encourage you to, to check that out. Um, I think before we potentially wrap up, um, I'm going to throw it to, to Aaron one more time to, to address uh, the final question that we have here in our, our chat. Aaron, can I throw it to you? Sure, Ken. Um, so just touching on a couple points, we are a three-tier um, department. We have public safety officers, we have peace officers, and we have armed peace officers. Um, all the supervisors are armed and they are, um, our building is on campus. Uh, our armed officers work over at the hospital med center across the street, but if there is an incident, of a critical incident, um, we would do a joint response with um, RPD, Rochester Police Department. I encourage you to check out the um, public safety website that I put in the group chat. You'll be able to locate the Think Safe and the Clary Act. Um, so those are annual, annual reports um, indicating the uh, crimes on campus and off campus as well. And I would say um, the most popular crime that we have is crime of opportunity, which falls within, you know, larceny pretty much is when students kind of, they get so excited and they want to set up shop in the library and claim their spot. And then they go to the cafeteria for three hours and then come back and they're like, oh, my MacBook's gone. Uh, so we always encourage students, if you're not going to be actually at the desk, take all your belongings with you. Um, and the most popular request I get um, from students is talking about situational awareness. And that's a great presentation that I give to students and it's useful for on campus, off campus. And it's essentially, you know, just being aware of your surroundings and thinking outside the box. Um, I think it's common sense, but I also work in this field. So it's, it's my job to think of all the what ifs that can happen. So when I open it up to students and um, explain that to them, it's easy for them to transition. There's situational awareness when they're working in the lab, 
and making sure that they don't put like certain chemicals next to an open flame. And so that's exactly what situational awareness is. You just have to broaden it to other parts during the day. How quickly can EMT reach dorm rooms and how close to get to the hospital? So the, um, the EMTs that come on campus, the student, the students, it's really benefit to have the MERT team working because they're the students. So they know the tunnel system, they know the dorms. Um, so, I mean, usually they're about five minutes out if when they're in service. Um, and AMR, if MERT's not in service, AMR comes for a student injury illness. Um, we have two public safety officers. One will have their lights on closest to the building. So AMR knows, you know, where to find the building. And then we obviously have keys. So public safety escorts AMR into the building and um, they give the uh, medical services they need. And like I said, across the street is the um, hospital. So we're very close by. There are security cameras. We have over 800 cameras between the hospital med center, uh, Eastman campus, um, and they're monitored 24 seven. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate you answering those uh, questions back to back uh, and getting that in for everybody. It looks to me like we've exhausted uh, the questions in the Q&A. Um, so uh, we'll take this opportunity uh, again to congratulate all the admitted students joining us today. Um, for maybe any family members or parents that we have here, um, this, as I said, this session has been recorded and will be up on the 2026 Experience YouTube channel in the coming days. So if you want to re-engage with this or share uh, with your student if they weren't able to attend, we want to make sure to get this really important information about many of the individuals and the offices they represent today out to you uh, as soon as possible. Um, uh, I think everybody here has thrown their contact info in various forms in the chat. If you didn't get a chance to do that now, um, I'll, I'd invite you to go ahead and, and do that. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for some great information and for their time and willingness to engage with admitted students virtually and answering their questions either live or in the chat. Um, we hope uh, to see many of the you admitted students at some future events. Um, please reach out to any of us if we can follow up with more details. Uh, and again, congrats on your admission to the class of 2026. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day from wherever in the country or outside the United States you might be joining us from. Bye, everyone.